Okay, uh, so welcome everyone. Uh, thank you all so much for coming out tonight. My name is Hillary. Um, I am the adult services librarian at Morrill Memorial Library. Um, and I am very pleased to be here with Kate Donovan of uh, Blackstone Valley Veggie Gardens um, as part of the first offering in our fall sustainability series. Um, it is co-sponsored by Together Yes, Progress Norwood, um, Norwood Community Media, and of course, uh, the Friends of the Morrill Memorial Library. So thank you to all of our partners. Um, I wanna let everyone know that um, if you have questions, feel free to pop them in the chat. Um, and there will be an opportunity to ask those questions at the end of the program. Um, but please do wait until the end when Kate gives us the, head, the, the go ahead um, to start asking those. Uh, and without further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and pass it over to Kate. Thanks, Hillary, and welcome everyone. Uh, since I haven't really uh, done much in that this area, I don't know if any of you have uh, followed me. I do quite a few of these, I'd say two or three a week. And just so you know, I, I believe I have 18 or 19 um, sustainability and gardening related topics in, in the portfolio that we do. So if we were in a room like, like the days before COVID, it seems like a million years ago, and we were doing this in a library, I would pass around a hand up, hand out uh, uh, the, the sign up sheet. And if you wanted a, a hard, a soft copy of this presentation, you would just sign the sheet. Now, uh, I don't know who you are. So if you want a copy of this, get a lot of good reference material in it, please you can contact me by in one of two ways. The first is by my email, it's a Gmail account, bbveggiegardens at gmail.com. And the second one is to go to my website, blackstonevalleyveggiegardens.com. And if that is an interesting place uh, to go, it actually has links to our, uh, uh, we have a page with all our events. So we have a lot of Zoom events and I'm sure that Hillary doesn't mind if you actually cheat on the library and, and you know, uh, go to another, uh, you know, another uh, Zoom meeting from another library. So I, like I say, I have plenty of them. And you can see all that. There's also links to our YouTube videos and uh, different press releases and all that kind of stuff. And there's some stuff in there about the, the, the video of, you know, when we did the Boston Flower and Garden Show. So in any case, if you want to get in touch with me and oh, also on the website, there's a link that says contact us. So if you're up there browsing around and checking out the site, there's also a contact us link. And if you plug all your information in that will also go directly to my email. And ask, also, I, we answer, I answer any questions you have regarding Basically, I'm a, a food grower and sustainability person. So any questions you have, ask me. If I don't know the answer, um, I have a Facebook group with, I believe it's 69,000 people from across the world. So I love to crowdsource. We have some great gardeners in there, authors in there. The guy, you know, which is, for example, one guy's written books on, um, on the, uh, what do they call it? The straw bale gardening and we have all kinds of bloggers and uh people that sell seeds luke marion from um uh, he has i forget the name mi gardener seeds he has reasonable seeds he's he's a member so we get all kinds of stuff so in any case in any event these are the ways to get in touch with me email or uh via my website this uh this presentation is on sustainable gardening and as i say i have a whole boatload of presentations but, um, and usually we, we're, we're demand driven, you know, someone like, for example, one year the libraries were given a whole, uh, uh, the towns were given uh, from the state, were given some funds in order to procure some low cost compost bins. So the towns wanted me to do something on composting. So it, we're demand driven, but this one is mine because I've seen shortages. I've seen 
prices, you know, first with COVID, we had a lot of food shortages. And now, you know, the prices are rising. You know, even the people on Social Security are getting a 5.9% increase. You know, just basically to keep up with the cost of living, food has gone sky high. So, you know, and meat is going through the roof. If the meat is high, then maybe you can subsidize with a few more vegetables and, and grow them. So uh, with no you know, further delay, here is the, uh, the, the presentation. Sustainability, what is sustainability? It's being to, it's, you know, uh, it's doing more with less, really. It's uh, being more efficient, being more effective, saving money, saving time, getting more for your buck, in el elongating your gardening season uh, with less work, just being really efficient and effective in what, what you're doing. So what we'll review in this presentation is growing perennial food crops. Those are the gifts that keep on giving. They're not, they'll work, trust me, nothing, nothing, you know, nothing is going to grow for free. Or maybe an established apple tree will give you some trees, some fruit without doing much else to it. But basically you have to, you have to uh, tend to your perennials as well. But a little bit of effort will give you a whole ton of um, output. We'll learn a little bit about preserving your food. I mean, I'm I'm a I pride myself on my ability. I have a ton of stuff growing right now. Here we are, mid October. I have a bunch of kale. I have carrots growing. I've got beets I've yet to pick. I have ground cherries coming up, and uh, a whole bunch of stuff out there. Still peppers, eggplant. They'll go until a, until a freeze. So um, lengthening your growing season, definitely lengthening, lengthening your, lengthen your growing season. The best way to eat your food is from garden to, to plate. You go out and pick it, you bring it in and cook it. The most incredible thing, a couple of years ago, I had the opportunity to go to Italy and go on a, a cooking uh, event, cooking tour type of thing. And this lady had a, a commercial kitchen where you had six, eight people at a time rolling out dough, making gnocchis, making raviolis, homemade pasta, making sauce, all that kind of stuff, tiramisu. Uh, and it was, it was pretty awesome. But I noticed her refrigerator was about twice the size of a fridge that your kids have in college. You know, uh, uh, you know I don't know, probably 15 square feet or smaller. And the reason is that they go out and pick their food and bring it in and cook it. All the nutrients are still there and, and they don't really need a lot of place to, to store it. But we do, because even though I usually typically have something growing outdoors nine months out of the year, I'm an exception because I'm a gardening nut. Um, you still, you can't grow tomatoes after a hard, uh, you know, they, they don't even taste good probably now because it's getting too cold for them. So you got to preserve your food. You got to, you know, you got to bring it in and preserve it. We'll go over that and I'll show you a nice website that helps that you're paying for anyway. It's the USDA food preservation site. We'll also go over some tips for, for, for saving money because I'm, you know, people, people want to be more sustainable uh, and I'm just plain cheap. And I admit it, you know, I, I, I do want to uh, be able to save money. Well, save money so I can travel and spend it on exciting things, uh, not spending, spend it to, to feed myself. So, and then um, also, I, I should have put this in here. I guess it's kind of separate, making money as well. You can actually make money. There's some crops that are so prolific and easy to grow that you can actually, I'm not saying you're going to make a living out of it, you know, but you can certainly trade in sell a few to your neighbors and your friends and on Facebook groups and, and to try to get your uh, more, more spare change so you can spend it more on your, on your garden. So you can do that as well, saving money, making money. And then we'll take Q&A. Uh, Hillary's going to take your questions at the end. Please don't feel bad about asking questions. I really like it. I enjoy the feedback. And, uh, you know, I'll answer just about anything. So let's talk about perennials, okay? What is a perennial? I think most people, if you're in this, 
if you're in this presentation, you know a perennial is a, uh, uh, a plant that comes back year after year, unlike a tomato plant or a pepper plant or a cucumber or a squash that has a one year life cycle, life cycle and then anything that's produced of that is, is comes from the seed. But, uh, but these are perennials, a gift that keeps on giving. So let, let's talk about fruit trees. As I had stated earlier on, fruit trees are an awesome way uh, to, to get a lot of food in a very small space. So what can we grow here? We're in New England. We're in, uh, I believe, you are probably in zone 6A, the same as me. The USDA uh, breaks up our uh, the country into, into gardening zones. And that, and that depends upon when it freezes and when the, the, the first freeze date and the last freeze date. And we're, we're, in, we're in zone 6A here. So, um, you know, we, these are the plants that we can grow here in, in Southern New England. Basically, we can, and there's more than this, but these are the common ones people grow. Uh, they grow uh, peach trees, pear trees, apple trees, cherry trees, plum trees. And those are, those are uh, they, like I said, they can give you a lot, a lot of food, but you've got to take care of them. So what, what do we, you know, what do we consider when we are, uh, planting trees. First of all, we have to consider how big we want the tree uh, and how much space we have. For example, uh, the I have dwarf trees and dwarf trees grow to 10 feet tall. I don't want 25 foot trees. I don't want a full size tree because you know, you, how am I going to get up to the top to, to pick those apples? You need some kind of a tool to get up there. That's too much work. This way, I have a 10-foot tree, so I can just, you know, basically, uh, you know, get a small ladder and not kill myself and, and pick them from the top. So I have, a, I have dwarf trees tw to 10 feet. My son has semi-dwarf trees. Those grow to 15 feet tall. And uh, then there's the full size trees. So how, how far apart do I have to space them? I have to space my dwarf trees 10 feet apart. Basically, uh, it depends upon the size of the tree. Some trees that are semi dwarf, since they grow 15 feet, you space the trees 15 feet apart from each other. And if you have a tall tree, you know, that goes 30 feet, you space those 30 feet from each other. So it's the same space, um, the height, uh, that's how much space it needs on the ground. Also, you have to consider, are these trees self-pollinating or are they cross-pollinating? Let me see what I have here for the slide. Okay, oops, let me explain that. Apple trees, for example. Apple trees need another, basically, there are exceptions in certain kinds, but apple trees and, and pear trees need another apple tree or a pear tree in order to cross pollinate. So if you have a single apple tree, unless it's a very special kind, you're not going, you may get an apple or two, but you're really not going to get a full fruiting from that tree. And in order to get a full fruiting, not only do you have to plant another tree, but you have to plant a different variety of tree that uh, flowers at the same time so that they can cross pollinate. It sounds very counterintuitive, but if you have a tree fruit tree that needs cross pollinating. Like for example, let's take a, 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 a Macintosh apple. You think that you're gonna cross pollinate it with another Macintosh apple, it won't work. 
you have to cross pollinate it with, I'm just guessing now, a Fuji apple or some kind that actually goes to a flower at the same time. So do some research before you buy your tree. Find out if they're self-pollinating or if they're cross-pollinating. And find out, you know, what size it is, and and that will help you determine how far apart to space them. So also, if you're going to buy trees, understand the type of tree, and, and you got to do your research. The for example, a, a pear tree and apple trees um, will not really give you good fruiting. If you buy them small, they won't really give you good fruit for six or seven years. So be patient. Because you know one thing, if you don't plant them at all ever, you won't get any. So I mean, you you have to you have to be patient with them. They are they are forms of life after all, right? So just you know, be aware that your fruit trees can can give you a, a good load of fruit. And somebody asked me once, if you buy the if you buy the the dwarf trees, do you get the same size fruit? You get the same size fruit. But you obviously don't get enough as much because there isn't as much volume of, of the tree, but you do get a full size fruit. So, okay, let's talk about some more. Let's talk about some fruit bushes. So these are the ones that I have, and I don't know if I have any, any more than this, but it, it's, it, that's quite a lot. Um, it, it's a lot more, uh, well, complicated, I guess. Than, than one would think. But basically, uh, blackberries, let's talk about blackberries. Blackberries over here have very long thorns, unless you buy the, the thornless blackberries. Um, if you turn the leaf over and look at the underside, it's green, just like the top of the leaf. It gives you a nice, I think the, the, the flavor of a blackberry bush is on the tart side, tart, more tart than a, than a decent raspberry bush. It, so, and the raspberries, and uh, the, the fruit is, goes from red to black. A raspberry bush, and it's in the, it's no wonder, it's, it's in the thorn, uh, the rose family, no wonder why it has those big, big uh, thorns on it. They can be a half an inch long. So, and, it, and if you, if I walk by my rat, my blackberry bushes, it seems like they, they try to attack me. I always get one sticking to my, my top or my uh, pants. I swear that they're, they're uh, alive. So then we, the, the cousins over here are the, are the raspberries. And if you look under the leaf of a raspberry, you'll see that it's bluish white, completely different than, than the, uh, than its cousin, the blackberry. Now, raspberries are, there's quite a few different cultivars, different varieties of raspberries. Some are red, some are yellow or golden colored, I should say, and some are black. What's the difference between a black raspberry and a blackberry? Well, the black raspberry has a green leaf and big, big thorns, and the, uh, the, the black raspberry tastes just like a raspberry. It doesn't have the big thorns. It's a little fuzzy on the stem, but not really the, the big thorns, and it's, it's blue and white on, underneath the leaf. Different plant altogether. You have get the canes, or the, I'd say you say the branches from the blackberry that can grow up 10 feet long, and they the blackberries and raspberries both need a pruning. And so do some research before you get them. Uh, some blackberries typically bloom in the summer and raspberries bloom in the summer, but some raspberries actually, they call them ever bearing. They have two flushes of fruit uh, in the summer and then in the early fall. I have some of them, they're called fall gold. They're the sweetest raspberries you could ever ever eat. And, and they just, just when they start to die out from the summer flush of fruit, Another another flush comes in, uh, fall gold. They're absolutely delicious. Both of these plants grow all over the place. Both both raspberries and uh, blackberries they grow all over the place. Because what happens when you plant them in your yard? They're very uh, hardy at the root, and they start popping up all over your yard, kind of like the the whack a mole game, you know. And typically, I see some growing up. 
from the root base and I, I pull them out and I, I have to give some to my son-in-law for my granddaughter. She just absolutely loves them. Um, but they, they do tend to get out of control if you don't, if you don't really take, take care of them. And then, uh, so that's basically the raspberries and the blackberries. Um, there's also blueberries and there's several different types of blueberries and they are basically the, these plants are, are self-pollinating, but uh, nonetheless, they still tend to do better when planted in close proximity, proximity with another, another slightly different variety uh, that, that uh, flowers at the same time. So even though they're self-pollinating, they still, still do best with a neighbor that's just a little bit different from itself. So they're great, uh, berries are great. Of course, you can pick them fresh and go out there what I do in the summer, it, well, starting, starting in, in June, because I have the, uh, the strawberries. I didn't go over those, but, but uh, I didn't go over the, the strawberries. Uh, but I, I, I pick them and you know, then in the summer with these berries, pick them fresh, put them in a smoothie, put them in your uh, pancakes, make waffles out of them. The, uh, you can make jelly if you, once they start really producing, if you have extra, you can always, always produce jellies and jams. So, and you'll see that slide on, on the, in the preservation section of this uh, presentation. So perennials, you got to feed them, you got to spray them, and you got to prune them. Basically, um, I'm an organic gardener. There are some organic uh, different types of fertilizer you can use. You know, and you don't typically use the same fertilizer for a small plant, like a, an herb, for example. What's an herb? An herb, you really don't want it to grow too fast. You don't want it. You don't want it to bear seed. You don't want it to bear fruit. It doesn't bear any fruit. So you're going to, you know, you really probably, if you have good soil, you might not even have to feed your, your herbs. But you certainly have to give your, uh, your trees a little oomph. So you do feed them. There is special organic fertilizer you can, you can put on them. Same with your, with your bushes. And you spray them because the fruit is very sweet and it will attract every ant and every bug that crawls on the face of the earth. So you do have to spray them and the spray is a, you know, it coats them. It's also a, uh, a pesticide, organic pesticide. I don't know, you can use neem oil. There's a number of things, but they have the pre-mixed organic sprays that you can use on your bushes and your, and your trees. And also, Trust me on this, you should prune. But the way you prune an apple tree is different than the way you prune a peach tree is different than the way you uh, prune a, a, a raspberry bush or a blackberry bush. So do your research or ask me. I actually do have a, a, a whole presentation on the backyard orchard and I can, I can share that information if you want. The worst thing to do, you, you can you can omit pruning for a season and it's not going to be the end of the world. But if you prune too deeply or prune at the wrong time before the plant goes into dormancy, you can lose a whole year's worth of fruiting. So you, you have to know if you're going to prune, you should prune, but you have to know what you're doing. So watch a video or send me an email and, and tell me what type of plant you have and I'll give you some suggestions. So some other perennial plants I wanted to talk to you about. The first one has been around here in our area in Massachusetts since at least the 1600s before the King Philip War, because when, when my area anyway was inhabited by the, the Nipmunk, the Native Americans, the Nipmuc tribe, they grew Jer Jerusalem artichokes. They're also called sunchokes. They look like Ginger doesn't it look like ginger. It's kind of knobby and uh, doesn't taste at all like ginger. And it's not at all in the ginger family. But it, it's actually uh, it grows to be a 10 foot tall uh, sunflower. It's brightly colored yellow. It's not a big, huge sunflower. Uh, 
you know, like some of them, but it's a small, somewhere between a daisy and a sunflower. And what happens is the tuber is very voracious and uh, hardy, 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 hardy. Matter of fact, some people call it invasive and they won't grow them for that reason. Uh, but I'm up, you know, I'm trying to teach you how to be sustainable and it's a wonderfully sustainable crop. Uh, the thing is, you, you really should probably grow them in, a, in, a, in their own bed and they will grow under the ground as well. So, uh, you know, if they grow where you don't want them to, you got to kind of dig them up. And after a while, they'll give up and stay where they're supposed to stay. But what happens with the Jerusalem artichokes, as I say, those are tubers. And what do they taste like? They taste like somewhere bet between a water chestnut and a potato. But you can shred them and eat them in a, in a slaw. You can eat them raw. You can steam them. You can put them in a stew. You can slice them up and put them in a stir fry. They don't have much of a taste. Matter of fact, if you put it in a stew along with some, you know, some carrots and some celery and some potato, you won't really be able to even taste any difference between that and the potato. But they just did a the gift that keeps on giving. That they're, they're they're awesome. And um, how about asparagus? So asparagus comes in three different colors. I grow the purple and the green. I know there's a white. I should throw some in there. Um, but asparagus, you 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 plant. You can plant. You can start the plants by seed or you can grow the actual root base it's called an asparagus excuse me asparagus crown and if you can find those now you can certainly put them in in the fall in the fall these perennial plants you can plant them in the fall don't be afraid to plant you're not going to get any you ain't going to get anything you know in, until the spring anyway but you can certainly plant them in the fall um so asparagus it takes about two to three years to get a good asparagus patch growing. But I'm going to tell you, a good asparagus patch, as long as it's properly weeded and fed, you'll be bearing, uh, you know, they last for 40 years, up to 40 years. So I'll be long gone and my asparagus patch, which I started about maybe four years ago, will still be, will be coming up. And the good thing about growing asparagus is it's a spring crop. So this is before you've got, certainly before you've got any tomatoes or, or what have you. And you want to do that too. You want to grow, to grow different things that you can have, you know, during the year. And by the way, Jerusalem artichokes, I should have said this. You wait for a hard freeze. It kills off the big sunflower and then you dig them up and they're a little bit on the sweeter side. There's a reason why the Jerusalem artichokes, you can't find them in the store. It's because they don't have a really good shelf life outside the ground. So you'll see people on Facebook groups and uh, you'll see them selling them, you know, because they just dig them up and sell them when they get an order. But they don't, in grocery stores, they don't, they don't sell food necessarily that tastes good. They sell food that transports good, you know, transports well to, to various grocery stores, but um, they don't necessarily sell, sell stuff because it tastes good. Also, both of those, the first two are, are very healthy for you. Jerusalem artichokes is, uh, a lot of people have a hard time uh, digesting, can cause a little stomach upset. Um, because it it's, contains inulin, but it's also supposed to be really awesome for for diabetes. So I'm not a doctor or anything, but that's what what they say. So uh, then uh, let's talk about strawberries. Strawberries, a strawberry patch will last as long forever, as long as you clean it up. You better weed it, because the way strawberries, I don't uh, probably a lot of you grow strawberries, it's very common to grow strawberries. Uh, but strawberries reproduce by shooting out these branches up on top, they're called runners. And anywhere that branch lands, a new strawberry plant will form and will kind of sink into the ground. So they will keep reproducing. And then the, the original plant, they're clones, right? It's really part of the same plant. 
So the original plant will die off after three or four years and it'll leave a little woody stub in the ground. So, I mean, so you have to go in and clean them out in, in those, the, the runners, the actual branches, they die off as well. So you got to clean it up a little, you know, so the, the plants can actually, uh, you know, have the opportunity to, to set into the ground. But if you take care of an asparagus patch and clean it up every year, um, you'll have more than more than enough and, and you'll have more than enough to share uh, with your friends and family as well. Basically, strawberries, there's, there's many, many different kinds. There's yellow strawberries, there's white strawberries. I got some a few years ago from the Gurney company. They don't pay me, but they're, they're called Whoppers and they're big, supposed to be as big as a peach, but I didn't get them to be as big as a peach. For me, they, they grew about as big as a golf ball and that's fine. But this year I had a patch, it's probably about four by four. And I got about three gallons of strawberries, which, which isn't too bad. I still have some in the freezer now. So there's two different, we'll put them into two categories. There are the June bearing, which bear, uh, logically they, they bear fruit from, from the end of, the end of, uh, the end of May till probably the, the, the first or second week in July. So they're basically June berry. And those are the big fat ones. Those are the ones that you, you know, you, you pull up and you, and you freeze some or make, make jam or what have you. There's other ones, and I guess they can grow kind of big, but those are the uh, ever-bearing strawberries. They're a little bit smaller. But of course, they, they supposedly, I don't have any, but supposedly they will bear fruit from the, from the spring right through to the summer. So... Choose them carefully as well. You can have different types of strawberries uh, in the same bed, and there will be no ill effect from that. So you can have a, a wide variety without worrying about any kind of negative cross-pollination effect. So I think everyone should grow strawberries. It's the greatest thing. Sometimes, though, with the strawberries, you have to throw a net over them. Because we like them, and so do those dang birds. I'm telling you, they, they'll go in, and you'll be waiting for that first strawberry to get nice and, and fat and red. And then you go out, and you, you see it. You know, you, you look out the corner of your eye, and you see it. You go over, and you see a big bite mark taken out. So I don't know if it's a bird or maybe squirrels or something. But everyone everyone likes the strawberry. So I, if, if you do have a lot of little critters, you may want to throw a, a net over them. Uh, also herbs, herbs, herbs are great to grow. They're very easy once you, once you get them growing. Um, herb seeds, typically a lot of them, a lot of the perennial herbs, are, a penny, let, let me tell you what perennial herbs are. I have a class in, in herbs as well. Perennial herbs are uh, mint, you know, common mint, peppermint, spearmint, lemon balm, uh, sage, thyme. Uh, what else am I missing? Oregano. All these plants come back. They come back every year. But you got to keep them neat. First of all, I suggest your plants be grown in a pot and not in the regular garden bed because the roots may become invasive, especially when you're, when you're in the, it, the mint family. And they'll be growing up where you don't want them to and they will have an effect on your other, they'll strangle your other plants. They don't play nice in the in the garden with other plants, unfortunately. So, but definitely, uh, definitely herbs are, are awesome to grow. They come back year after year. What the, the, the only thing that, that happens once, once you see them kind of struggling and you, and you, you go and, and see what's going on in that pot, you see they're probably root bound. So you have to take them up and you have to split them apart. And, you know, one, one big pot of mint can give you five or six pots of mint. Or, or lemon balm. And, you know, herbs are good. Number one, I, I, like I say, I'm not a doctor. I don't like to give medical advice, but you can, you can, uh, you know, there are some, some, some uh, products, some herbs that are really, really good for uh, antiseptic and others are good. You know, just, just to give you an example, right? You know, I don't know. When I was a kid, we used to have Pepto-Bismol. I don't know if they have it now, but it used to taste like mint. It actually at one time was made from mint which actually soothes the stomach, which is why they put it in there. Um, now they put in a chemical a product that, that tastes like mint. So, um, 
it's it's no longer made with mint, but that that's why they you know the original uh, product of, of the Pepto Bismol was made with mint because mint soothes the stomach. So you can look into uh, medicinal uses for your herbs. Or the other thing to do is, you know, you can have a boring old meal like a, a meatloaf or whatever, you know, and you can make it taste so much better with some herbs. Not only that, but you can dehydrate them, you can freeze them, uh, you know, and then what I do with my herbs uh, every year is, you know, they're, they're fragile, they're, they're fairly fragile on top. And even though some of them uh, will will last through the winter, um, they'll get all scraggly and they won't grow well. So what I do with my perennial herbs is I cut them right at the base every year. I mulch it over and, you know, feed it and, you know, put, put some compost in there and, and put some mulch around them. And every year they come back growing nice and rounded and just perfect. And that's the way to do. you don't have to give them, like I say, you don't have to give them heavy fertilizer or anything. They're herbs, you know, you don't want them to go into overdrive and you don't really want them to go to go to seed too quickly because that affects the, uh, the flavor of the, uh, the herbs so makes them a little bit bitter so all right so that is the 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 piece on the perennials so now let's and please put questions in the chat i love the questions i really do honestly um and your comments as well because you know people have been i can't teach people you know how to garden people have been gardening for thousands of years and you know in doing organic gardening obviously you know my 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 parent my grandparents used to call it just gardening because that's the way they, they used to do it so everything old is new again and you know such as the circle so all right let's talk about preserving your food and we do this because as i say especially when we're in we're in new england best way to eat is garden to plate pick your stuff out in the morning and and uh, and cook it immediately. Cook it; it's more flavorful and nutritious that way. But since a lot of us want to have, you know, tomatoes are the most uh, the common most commonly grown vegetable here in in New England, and they are so fragile they won't take a even a, a frost, let alone a freeze. And uh, so we we do want to take them in, and you know, every every year being as I'm Italian American, I, you know, have my family over and usually have some, some lasagna and some kind of pasta dish, you know, vegetable lasagna made with the homemade sauce and, and some, uh, you know, some of the zucchini and eggplant that I've preserved in various ways. So, uh, so yeah, we can definitely do, do that. Um, canning, you can do canning. People are very afraid of canning because they think they're going to get botulism. You won't if you do it uh, properly and if you follow the instructions that you're given. I also have another presentation. I'm not sure whether we're doing it, uh, Hillary, or in this group, but I am doing it. I, I do it on occasion. It's specifically for canning, freezing, and dehydrating. Uh, but as a general rule, uh, you can can your own your own uh, fresh produce. Sometimes if it's a high acid food, like fruit or uh, tomato sauce or something that's pickled, because of course the vinegar that's used in the pickling is highly acidic, you can use a water bath canner, which is just an old big old pot, a big old lobster pot, or you know something that you, you cook a lot of pasta in or something, big high pot you can use. For the rest of the stuff, like if you wanted to take your your garden carrots and and uh, your uh, you know your peas and what have you and make a make a stew out of it or a chili, you know, with your peppers and and stuff with meat in it, then you're going to need a uh, a pressure canner, and that actually seals up. And creates pressure, and there's a gauge on it, and 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 uh, so those are that's for low acid food, and meat. So meat is a low acid food. But if you just for example, I, I know this is confusing. 
if I'm going to make pickled beets, I can use a regular canner because pickled beets are being preserved. They're using, um, they're using vinegar, which is high acid. But I don't like pickled beets. I like the taste of beets. And I may want to preserve some in just in water. And if I want to preserve them in water, beets are typically a low acid food. So therefore, I have to use a pressure canner. But all this stuff about it is in the, the, the link. And, and I'm going to show you that a link to that uh, information. As I say, it's the USDA canning uh, uh, food preservation website. And, and we all pay for it anyway, because it's, it comes from our tax dollars. But if you do can, uh, the, reason you, the reason you can is because you have a plethora of food that you've that you've either grown or you've gotten from a CSA or it's in season, so it's less expensive. But uh, it will last you until the next season. So, and then, you know, it may last two years. It could last a lot longer depending upon, you know, how well the seal holds up on the, on the mason jar. But basically as a rule of thumb, you should be canning, well, so I'll just give you an example. You want to can your tomatoes. Tomatoes, the tomato harvest starts in August and September. And you want to uh, have those tomatoes, if you want to have them all year round, you want to have them until tomatoes start coming out again the next August. You don't need to save two years. You know, you don't need to save them for two years because you have more growing. So that's the point. So, you know, when you buy a can, I'm talking about a metal can, tin can or whatever from the store, those last five years because they're processed, they use a lot of sodium and a lot of junk, and uh, they're not really all that good for you. And, they, and there's so much heat that goes into them that they pretty much destroy all the nutrients in the food anyway. So canning lasts a year. And like I say, and um, the it does lose some amount. <clears throat> excuse me, it does lose some amount of nutrients because the process of canning uses heat. And heat will decrease the amount of um, vi the water-soluble vitamins, I believe they're B and B and D, I think. I'm not, I'm not sure. B and C, B and C. Um, so be, be aware of that. Freezing is a great opportunity to elongate your you know your make your food last and the best way to freeze is to is to make sure you suck all the dry the food and make sure you suck all the air out of it you can and store it in plastic uh freezer bags i have a food saver and a lot of and they cost i don't know they cost probably between 99 and 90 100 dollars and 200 dollars but they last a good 10 years. So it's $10 a year. It's worth it. You know, it's worth the investment. There's a return on your investment there of all the food you can save by buying, by growing your own or by buying in season food, uh, you know, going to the, uh, the farmer's market or what have you. And freezing, the thing about freezing is if you, if you, pick the food or you or you get really fresh produce and you freeze it aside from blanching it which is a process where you submerge it in hot steam or boiling water for two minutes and then stop the cooking process by putting the food in ice water for another two minutes uh, that's called blanching Aside from that, there's, there's not a lot of heat used. So freezing actually is the best way to preserve food from a nutrients point of view. However, that's not going to help you out if you lose your, your heat or, or your refrigerator dies out or you lose your... I still remember one time and in, in, I was working with a bunch of these uh, fine people from, from Worcester area. And there was some power storm, some freak storm, early spring storm. And they lost their power for a good week. So what can you do? I mean, you, there's only so much you can store in your, in your cooler or what have you. So by, by canning, obviously canning 
um, you know, you don't, you don't need any, any, uh, you know, you don't need any freezer room. You can just obviously put it in the shelf. So, uh, although freezing is the, the, the best way from a health point of view, it's, it's, you know, it's, uh, it can't be used if you have no electricity. Also, uh, dehydrated, dehydrated foods. You, what happens when you dehydrate is you, you, I have a dehydrator and that's the best way to do it. They say you can actually dehydrate using an, an oven, but a lot of times it doesn't go, the, the heat doesn't go down low enough. And sometimes the, the food gets scorched. So I would suggest that you get a dehydrator. I have a dehydrator. My dehydrator uh, is an Excalibur, which is a decent brand. I got the low end. It doesn't have a lot of bells and whistles, but it costs two hundred dollars, and it's and it's quite large. You can get a dehydrator for a lot less than that, uh, but of course, I have a lot of food to to. I do all my herbs, and and you know, I do my my zucchini, my my squash, and uh, a whole bunch of other food. So I, I I use it, but you can get the smaller ones for a lot less than that. But the benefit of dehydrating is. You don't have to worry about botulism or the, you, you, the, the, uh, the fuel for that is, is water, you know, the moisture, but you're removing a vast majority of the moisture from your food by the dehydrating process. So after a while, I, I would say they, it stays pretty good for about, I'd say about a year or two. And after that, uh, it begins to lose a little bit of nutrients every year and it will lose a little bit of flavor. You can still eat it. Uh, but, but, uh, you know, it'll, it'll stay, it'll stay, uh, edible. And just to tell you a little bit about this dehydrating, there is a method for food drying that I'm not mentioning and that's freeze drying. You see a lot of freeze dried foods. You see a lot of the, I have a lot of, uh, friends I belong to. I'm not a prepper, a doomsday prepper, certainly. But they're the best as far as food preservation. They they are very knowledgeable group, and uh, so they a lot of them buy the the, the small food dehydrators cost two thousand dollars. So it'll last a long time, but it's still just a lot of money, you know. And but the food you dry that way will last you for thirty years. So that's what people that really want to stock up and you know fill their bunkers up with. Uh, you know, under the ground bunkers in case the apocalypse comes. Uh, but for the for the vast majority of us, we can do well with the with a simple dehydrator. So, and in a good dehydrator, you can dehydrate anything. You can dehydrate. You can make your jerky. You can you know dry meat. You can you can uh, do any kind of vegetable. Basically, any kind of vegetable you want. And uh, what happens? Uh, some stuff you dry like. You know, if you, if you uh, mess, uh, uh, cook down your apples, you know, take the core out and peel them and cook down your apples, make like an apple sauce and, and dehydrate it. Dehydrators are, uh, they, they have mat, mass that you can put down there uh, instead of the, uh, you know, usually, usually there's a bunch of holes in them, but you put down a mat and if you put down the, uh, the applesauce or pear sauce or uh, cherry sauce or whatever, you can make fruit roll-ups for your kids and you can eat them just like that. But basically, if you dehydrate something, uh, I'm trying to think of something, I dehydrate zucchini. And let, let's let me give you an example of, of how, to, how to do it. Um, zucchini is all water. Right. But you have so many in the garden. I mean, my goodness, you know, one plant give you five or six good size zucchini. And Lord knows if you blink an eye and you don't catch it because they're green and they and they grow on the bottom of the, the garden. You might miss it. It comes out as big as a baseball bat. Don't throw those away. Uh, those are perfectly fine. If the skin is a little tough, you can you can peel it off. But what I do is I, it takes two cups of zucchini to make uh, a zucchini bread. So I grate my zucchini in each tray of my food, uh, my dehydrator. I put two cups of zucchini and I dehydrate it. When I'm done and I take out the tray, 
there's a half a cup of dried zucchini in there. There used to be two cups, but it reduced 75% to only a half a cup. I take those half cup portions and I put it in my freezer bag. I mean, I, yes, in, in my, the same, the same um, freezer bags, even though I'm not freezing them. I put them in the, the uh, food saver or the uh, bags and uh, take all the air out. Of them. And then I just throw them in my cabinet. So anytime I want to make a zucchini bread, I will open that up and put it in a bowl and I'll continue to add a little water to it until it blows back up and, and it looks the same two cups of zucchini that I dehydrated in the first place. So that's how you do it. It saves a lot of space. I mean, I can have in a square foot, I can probably have 10 zucchinis in there in those little pouches from my food safe. Just an, just an idea. Some stuff, has, the reason I mentioned the app, the fruit roll-ups is because some stuff, um, or, or, or they have the, the dehydrated apple, you know, when you cut the apples up, the fruit, and people like to eat them just, just like that. So some stuff you can eat just like that and other stuff you can rehydrate, so. Now here's the website, I have it here. I'm gonna, before, uh, well, if you send me uh, your email, I'll send you off this link. But if you Google National Center for Home Food Preservation uh, or USDA Food Preservation, you'll, you'll, you'll come to this link. And what does this link tell you? It tells you how to can, how to freeze, how to dry, how to cure and smoke, how to ferment, how to pickle, how to make jams and jellies, and how to store food. For this particular screenshot, I, I press can. And in the canning, it'll tell you the principles of home canning. Those are the instructions I said about high acid versus low acid foods, et cetera. Select, is selecting, preparing, and canning fruits and fruit products. So depending upon the fruit or, the, or whatever you're canning, you have to process it at a different time, uh, you know, shorter or longer. Obviously, if you have little pint jars, they don't take as long to can to process in the water as a, a whole, uh, you know, a whole quart. So, uh, so different guide for selecting, preparing, canning vegetables and vegetable products. And then there's preparing and canning poultry, red meats and seafood. And yes, that's a nice option. To, uh, to be able to can can foods. Like I say, your meal, you, it, there's nothing like comfort food in the winter, right? So if you're growing all these vegetables, you can make your stew and you can make your, your uh, soup, your chicken soup and what have you, and you can uh, can them all. And uh, then if you come home from work and you don't feel like cooking, you can just open them up and, and heat them up. So easy peasy, so. National Center for Home Food Preservation. Okay, so let's talk about lengthening the season. As I stated, I have stuff growing uh, nine to 10 months out of the year outside. So yes, even in December, I can go out and pick something. Onions, or carrots can overwinter. I had some wonderful spinach that was, it came back in the spring. I planted it in the fall. It came in the spring and I had bushes, literally bushes of spinach. Spinach doesn't like the heat though. And basically if I, if I plant it in the late spring, the same time I plant my cucumbers, I'm lucky to get, you know, a week out of it before it just bolts on me. So uh, some, some, some crops are good, you know, to plant in the fall and some come up early in the spring. I wanted to show you this because I'm cheap. And because it's a really good way, first of all, it's, uh, you know, I try to stay away from plastics. Um, and so I have to basically uh, get these from my friends and neighbors and they're more than willing to give me their trash. So, um, but this is another method for early starting. Basically when you start seeds, uh, there are some plants that uh, you want to get a head start on the season. So you either start them indoors 
uh, or you stack them in a greenhouse or something funky like that. But this is a way uh, to plant by using these milk jugs. So what happens, milk jugs or water jugs or whatever, the two gallon ones are actually better. The way you could, so if anyone drives by my house and you see, in, I put them in the front yard because it's sunnier out there. So anytime uh, after, after December, you may ride by my house and wonder why I have a bunch of trash in my front yard. But I assure you, it's for gardening purposes. So you take these water jugs or these two gallon jugs and you cut them uh, right down the, the center, not lengthwise, but widthwise, right, right around here. And then you poke holes in the bottom for drainage. You fill it up with a good soil, not a potting soil, not a seed starting soil, a good, good potting soil, uh, or you can make your own potting soil. And then you plant the seeds, you wrap them up uh, that you don't want any, uh, any air to get in or, or any water to sink, sink, uh, sink in where you cut it. So you, you uh, wrap it up with some duct tape and you write on it what, the, what it is and you leave the top off. So what happens through the winter, see, and you plant them in the winter, I'd say probably January, sometimes February. We can do that here in New England. Other places in, in warmer climates, can't leave them out all winter because they have really warm spells where, you know, lengthy warm spells where it goes into the fifties or seventies. And, and then what happens is the germs start, the, the, the uh, seeds germinate and then the young plant will actually die when the freeze comes back, but we can do it. So I, I don't worry about it. So anyway, we plant seeds, we, we wrap it up. And then what happens is it rains and it snows, and some of the rain and snow go in that little hole. And then the sun comes out, and you get the greenhouse effect. So if you look at the top of, if you look at the, uh, the jug itself, you'll see it's raining on the inside because it has the evaporation and the condensation, and it, and it has its own little uh, microclimate in there. So every once in a while, you go out and look every week or so, and you see if you see that condensation. If you don't, you might have to throw a little bit of water inside. And after the, the it freezes and thaws and freezes and thaws, the sheath of the seed actually wears off. So, uh, and it will start to germinate. When will it germinate? It will, it'll start growing in the spring, right along the, about the same time it's supposed to start growing. I have great luck with this, uh, and I'll tell you what I, I don't I don't do it. I don't do my real summer crops, my cucumbers, my tomatoes, my peppers, my eggplant, my squash. I don't do them using this method because they they won't germinate until later in the season. Once they germinate, believe me, if you plant them next to one that you bought from. Uh, Home Depot or something, they'll eventually catch up. They're the sturdiest plants. You don't have to worry about them being going into transplant shock. They used to stay in outside. So it's a it's a rather new method. I think people have been doing it maybe, I don't know, maybe 20, 30 years. Uh, but it's a good way to reuse that plastic stuff. And there's a website on it here too, www.wintersome.org. And uh, there's there's, uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, Facebook groups specifically on winter sowing. So as I say, what I've had great luck with is all my brassica, my kale, my cabbage, my broccoli, uh, in my winter crops, my, my spinach. Uh, let's see what else I put in there. Um, onions do really well. Because onions you can transplant. I wouldn't do carrots or you can, you can do beets if you want, but sometimes carrots and beets, are, they're tricky when you transplant them because they've got that, that long root, you can damage it during the transplant process. But for winter crops, they're, they're really, they're awesome. Okay, so let's lengthen the growing season, okay? 
you can make a simple hoop house like this. This is PVC pipe over some kind of a raised bed. Uh, you can make your own little tunnel. There's two types of material you use to, uh, to put over your hoop house. One of them is a, a plastic material that's not porous. And just like the winter sewing with the milk jugs, you'll get that condensation and that greenhouse effect on the inside. And uh, you can use that. It definitely keeps on the inside of that hoop house, you know, it catches all this beautiful sun. And it, it'll be 15, 10 to 15 degrees warmer than the ambient air outside. So some stuff, so if you have a little bit of luck, you know, we gardeners rely a lot on luck, uh, but we always have a plan B ready to execute it in our pockets. But uh, with a little bit of luck, you can have lettuce and, and spinach growing in there all year round. So there's another type of material you might be interested in. It's a garden fabric. It's porous. It, it doesn't warm it up quite as much as the, as the plastic material, but the rain will go right through it as opposed to having the, the greenhouse effect because it's porous. And you get a little bit of air blowing it, blowing, blowing through it. And sometimes a little bit of air is good for your garden or else you may get some mold developing. So you can try them both and, you know, let me know, send me an email, let me know which one you like. It's not that much in either one, the plastic or the, uh, the, uh, uh, the garden fabric, the white garden fabric, you can get them both on, on Amazon. You can may even be able to get them on Home Depot. Uh, they're not very expensive and they can both be reused. So season after season. So also you can do a greenhouse. You know, I got a greenhouse that somebody bought and they never used and never put it together. I think it was like five, six hundred dollars. I got it for a hundred dollars. So you can get really good. If you're cheap like me, you can get good stuff on Facebook for sale groups. So but mine is a hobby greenhouse and I may eventually upgrade. You get what you pay for pretty much. But this one's kind of a homemade one. It has this. This is called glazing material. And you can buy these sheets. They're very lightweight. They don't break. They won't break. They'll blow away on you. They're not secured properly, but they, they'll, they'll never break. And they let more sun in. So you can, you can make it or, uh, you know, uh, you, or you can buy one. And the other thing is you can, you can make this, you know, you, you, you get every once in a while, you'll see, certainly see it on Facebook groups. So people are trashing them. You see old windows out there. You can certainly make a, a cold frame and, you know, you can start your plants in there uh, in the early in the spring to, to, to you know, so that you can, uh, in, in, instead of using the milk jugs, you can, you can use a cold frame to start your, your crops. And if you have a high enough one, you can certainly put your herbs in there to, so they'll last longer outside. So, okay, that's how you lengthen the season. So let's talk a little bit about uh, cool season crops. And because it's important, you know, I mean, I, I, I have so many people. I really like for people to be able to grow and, and be healthy all year round. So I have good gardeners, you know, wonderful gardeners that, that I know that just plant cucumbers zucchini, maybe a few green beans, tomatoes, and then they call it a day. Those are all summer crops, guys. You know, I mean, come on. You got you to gotta do a little bit better than that. So this is a, divided into four sections. These are, uh, the first one is hardy vegetables that you can start indoors. Broccoli, Brussels sprouts, cabbage, collards, onions, and rutabaga. When a freeze comes around, they laugh it off. So don't ever worry about, uh, about uh, well, I should say when a frost comes around, they, they, they laugh it off. Uh, the other ones that are also hardy vegetables, uh, they, you can direct seed them. You don't have to start them indoors. Kale, kohlrabi, 
peas, radishes, spinach, and turnips. And the definition of a hardy vegetable, these are hardy. They tolerate cold temperatures and they can survive a heavy frost. Of course, we've had times here in New England where it's been 70 degrees in the middle of January. And then we've had times when it's, you know, been below zero for a week at a time. So I don't know anything that would actually survive, uh, you know, the, those real, real cold spells that we've had. But you know what? Um, that's we're used to that here in New England. So you got to at least try. So the expense is a few seeds. No big deal. Right. So and these are semi hardy. The semi hardy vegetable will, will tolerate cooler, cooler temperatures and they can withstand a light frost. A light frost is like 36 degrees, 30, 32 to 30, 33 to 36 degrees is a, is a frost. Anything 32 and over, when the when the water turns to ice, then that's a freeze. So not a, not a frost. So that would be an artichokes, cauliflower, celery. Uh, and, and when do we have a, that's all the way through November, folks. You know, that's all the way through November. We, 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 we may go without a hard freeze. Arugula, Asian, and, and those are the ones you can start indoors. So the, the hardy, hardy ones that you can start Direct seed, arugula, Asian greens, beets, carrots, endive, lettuce, potatoes, salsify, Swiss chard. These, this is important as well. These are succession planting from seed, meaning that I grow, I start, I grow carrots and beets. And what I may do is I, sometimes I grow them in containers, big old containers and uh, deep, you know, uh, 10 gallon container. They need, they like the deep soil. So I may start them inside under a light in March. April comes around, I'll remove the, I'll take that whole container and put it outside. So by, you know, by mid April or the, the uh, probably, you know, late April, I'll have my first, my first crop ready to eat. And I'll continue in, 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 you know, before I eat, before I, you know, before I actually harvest my first crop, I'm planting seeds from my second batch. I may get three or four batches of carrots in one season. The same way with lettuce. Believe me, lettuce is, um, does not like the heat. It likes the heat. I can't say that. It likes the heat, but it doesn't last long. What happens is it bolts to seed that it starts to grow. And then it says, oh, it's too hot. I'm going to die. And what it does is it, it, it drops its seed. So it, because it wants to self propagate and it drops all its seed. So, um, but you can get, you know, three or four, five seasons of lettuce in, in, you know, five crops of lettuce in, in one season. Peas, you know, usually you, you start your peas. I start several kinds of peas and I plant, you know, and every once in a while, probably every week, I'll stick a couple of more peas in the, in the ground. And then, you know, by the end of the, by the end of the season, I'll save some of them and, you know, right out of the pot, I'll dry them, and then those are the ones that I'm going to start my uh, my pea crop with the next spring. So it starts all over again. So these are succession planting, meaning you can have more than one more, more than one crop of those particular vegetables in a season. So let's talk about money. That's always a good topic, especially when you don't have to spend it, and we're talking about the other way. Okay, so imagine having solar panels. You can get them and, um, you know, you go to your, your mass save. For those of us who are local, you can go to your ma mass save has, has programs where you can actually get, get solar panels installed at no cost. You can actually heat your greenhouse uh, with it. And you can power your house, obviously. You can heat your greenhouse. You can power, you can have drip irrigation, which is certainly a better way, you know, to conserve water. 
and you can actually send the excess back to the grid. So you can have a negative uh, electric bill and, and, it, it, and it will definitely help you be sustainable. And, and you know, it's not completely off grid, but, uh, but better than off grid because they can actually, in some cases, pay you, uh, you know, to, to have the solar panels. This is a very fancy drip irrigation. See, what happens is when people water their plants, a lot of times you, you only have so much space and the plants grow in very full. And when you water them with the hose, you're actually watering the foliage. And believe me, your leaves, the plants, the leaves love a nice drink. But basically what we're trying to do is we're trying to get the water to go into the, the root system. So uh, what, what, what you can do is you can, you can, you don't need anything. I mean, if you don't need anything really elaborate like this, you can get really expensive. People do whole farms, you know, using drip irrigation, but uh, you can get some, a uh, few of the hoses and, and uh, put them together. You can get that stuff at Home Depot or you can get it online as well. And what happens is out of each one of these uh, little, th the holes, you know, you'll, it, you can water, you water your plants. So also, um, you know, sometimes you don't have here in Blackstone, anyway, we don't have a lot of water pressure. So you may want to get a pump and you can actually put it on a timer. You know, the best, there's, there's, there's a big, huge, usually gardeners don't argue about much. You know, we're all kind of laid back type B type of people. But um, we do have this one huge debate whether to water in the morning or with water in the evening. I always think it's best to water in the evening because the, the plants absorb the water and then it doesn't evaporate right away. So it'll, it'll have some time to sink and in, seep into the roots and before it's evaporated by the sun of the day. Um, water doesn't really uh, burn your leaves unless it has some kind of, a, uh, if you have really hard water, it might, uh, you know, create that magnification effect on your leaves and, and burn it, but typically not. Uh, so that's not an issue, but some people want to do it in the real early morning and you can do that as well, but you can set this up that you can set your garden up to water itself um, and save, you know, save resources, you know, uh, save water. And, um, and if certainly if you had, uh, if you didn't have to pay for electricity, you know, by having the solar panels, that would be great. In the the kits that you use with all the the hoses or the the lines, uh, the kits start at like a hundred dollars at Home Depot. So, so another way to save money is uh, listen. We make compost anyway. We have salad. We we throw away our. Some people don't eat the skin of the potato. I particularly think it's the best part. But you know you you have. We have newspaper. Lord knows we've been doing a lot of shopping remotely. So we have uh, a ton of uh, uh, Amazon boxes. We mow our lawns. So why not take all that stuff, your grass clippings, your crushed fall, fallen leaves, coffee grounds, eggshell, shredded cardboard, shredded uh, brown paper, your, your, your leftover, your apple cores, your, uh, you know, your uh, vegetable scraps, throw them all in. If you do it, well, I have a presentation on composting as well. If you do it right, people say, oh my, it's not composting. If you do it right, it's gonna compost, it has to. Mother nature does it, right? I mean, obviously you see earth out, outside that's been replenished or, I mean, if it didn't, we'd be, we'd be, uh, at least uh, neck deep in, in leaves if, if none of them ever turn to soil again. So uh, you should be creating your own compost. And if it's in balance, I swear to you, if we were in a class, and my composting class in person, I would pass around my uh, mason jar full of fresh black gold and ask you to smell it uh, if you dared, but you have to trust me because it doesn't smell if it's a, and even if you live in the suburbs, you know, they've got these tumblers now that, that you can use and, and they, you, you cover them up, or you water them once in a while and you, you don't even have to use a pitchfork. You just kind of turn them around like, like when they, like the lottery, you know, when the, when, uh, you know, they, uh, the, when 
uh, the, the balls come out, you know, on that big round thing. So anyway, they, they're, they're pretty easy to, uh, pretty easy to make. And you can, you can turn your debris into black gold in, within six months. So also, uh, seed saving, um, I'm going to give you two tips here, folks, because I save my seeds. There's an issue with saving seeds. Some stuff you shouldn't because they can cross-pollinate. So look that up uh, and do some research. But at the end of the season, a lot of times you can get leftover uh, seed packs on the internet and they sell them at a, a huge discount. People are paranoid about it, I guess. They don't realize that Seeds last on the average now three to four years and they don't all die at once in the pack. So what you would do is uh, if the seed pack starts getting three, maybe four uh, years old, what you do is instead of putting one or two to a hole, maybe you put three or four to a hole or maybe you attempt to germinate them first using a, uh, a paper towel, a wet paper towel to see if you get any germination. But don't be throwing them away, you know, because, uh, you know, you read somewhere they're no good after three years because that's that's not that's not the case all the time. So um, dollarseed.com. I'm not going to tell you how much those seeds cost. Obviously, they they cost uh, 100 cents. Right. There's also I don't know if they're going up again, uh, but Little Shop of Seeds sells full size seed, seed packs for 75 cents. They may not have all the funky varieties and striped pep, striped uh, tomatoes and, you know, fancy schmancy stuff, but you get decent seeds for 75 cents for full size pack. The pack doesn't have pretty, probably doesn't have pretty pictures on it. It, you know, all that content you see on the back, you may have to research a little bit, uh, you know, to figure out how many, how many weeks it needs to come to fruition, but it's, it's good stuff and, uh, and a lot cheaper. So dollarseed.com and littleshopofseeds.com. Also, uh, we should be trading seeds with each other. So every year I, uh, I host a seed swap. It's been, in, it's been in Blackstone lately. And I've also helped some libraries spin up um, seed exchanges and you know get given some information on that as well. But I remember one time I wanted a specific seed. It was a beet seed and they're called Chioga beets and they're red and white striped beets. They look like a kind of like a peppermint candy when you open them. They don't taste a bit like peppermint. They taste like beets. But the only, I got them on Burpee, but I had to buy a pack that had a thousand beet seeds in it. They have like a two to three year typically uh, beets uh, lifespan. And, um, I, I mean, I like beets, but certainly not times a thousand. So I ended up going to the seed swap and I traded some for some cucumber seeds and some radish seeds. And that's what you got to do. You got to, you know, you got to, we all have to work together. Also, when you save seeds, um, make sure, you know, when you save them from your garden, make sure they're completely dry. And before you put them in the bag, or they'll mold one little iota of, of moisture in there and they're going to mold. So be very careful with it. And uh, once they're completely dry and you dry them on a, a piece of parchment paper or wax paper or even on a paper plate, but don't try to dry a whole bunch of them on a, uh, on a paper towel because they'll stick to it. it it's not a, not a pretty sight. Uh, so you, you, you put them in, after they're completely dry, you put them in little tiny baggies or, uh, you know, you, any kind of, any size bag you want, but you can get the little tiny seed, seed baggies from Amazon. I think they're like a thousand little baggies for $6. They're very, very inexpensive. They'll last, like I say, on the average of four years. And then what you do also is if you have, I have thousands of seed packs. I can't put them in my freezer. But the colder they are, the longer they'll keep. So if you have room in your freezer, put them in there. If not, seal them up. Like I say, make sure they're sealed. Make sure they're kept dark so they don't have any opportunity to want to germinate. And uh, keep them in a cool place. Maybe your basement would be a good place inside a, 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 a tub, a, one of those 
plastic bins would be a good opportunity. And, and they'll, and they'll uh, the, the cooler and darker uh, they are and the drier they are, the longer, the longer they'll last. So let's talk about cash crops because it's always good to, to save a little bit or to, to, to make a little bit of money to, to offset some of your other crops, right? So um, garlic is an interesting thing, it, uh, interesting plant because unlike a lot of them or most of them, you plant it in the fall. I'm gonna be, you plant it in October. So one, one bulb of garlic, uh, one bulb of garlic will give you about, I don't know, 15 cloves, maybe it depends upon the type of garlic it is. So in one, one bulb, uh, one, one little clove will grow a whole nother bulb. So if you have one, one bulb of garlic, you can grow 15 bulbs of garlic. You plant it in October. Uh, you plant it three inches down into a good composted soil. You give it, you know, some, some fertilizer and you cover it up with some nice warm mulch that's going to that's gonna keep it nice and warm and out of the light. And what happens is it starts to grow, grow bulb. And then in the early spring, you'll see the green start to shoot up. And then by, gar uh, by July, the, the green has kind of died off. Uh, if it's hard neck garlic, you, you cut the, the middle off. It's called a scape, a scape, S-C-A-P-E. And, uh, and then in, in you harvest your garlic in July. And then it lasts three or four months, even the hard neck. So by the time October comes around again, you take, you, you have saved all your garlic, you save one clove, I mean, one, one head, and you start the, the process all over again. Also, uh, you know, typically, and you can dry it or dehydrate it as well, uh, garlic, but, uh, but typically, you know, one garlic, do you really need 16 heads of garlic? Or you can take two heads and then you'll have 30 heads the next year. Do you really need all that? You can sell organic. If you put on Facebook, one of those for sale groups that you have organic garlic, this garlic heads, you know, suitable for, for seed crop, which means you can actually either eat them or plant them you'll have people coming out of the woodwork look, looking to buy it. Trust me, I know because I do it. Also, uh, your herbs, herbs, your perennials grow and they multiply quite quickly. You can, you can plant new ones by, you know, the, 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 uh, the seeds are small in herbs. So uh, you can split up your herbs. You can take cuttings from your herbs. If you know how to do that, you can propagate new plants from stems of existing plants. And people love to, to buy herbs as well. You can make baskets full of different kinds of perennial herbs and sell those as well if you want. They're easy to grow. Uh, radish. Radish is a good cash crop. Why? Because from seed to, to harvest is three weeks for a radish. So it's an awesome plant, a succession plant, but it grows so quickly you could take your spears you know, your extra down to the farmer's market and, you know, and dump it. And, they, and they're small, so you can grow a whole boatload in, a, in an eight-foot bed if you want it. Also, as I said, those sunchokes, the Jerusalem artichokes, whatever you want to call them, those are also prolific producers. I had, I think I started off with six that somebody gave me. And uh, by the next season, I probably had, I don't know, 100 tubers a lot and I sold them for two dollars a piece and people love them like I say they can't buy them in the store they love them so um, you'll have no problem uh, selling those as well and that just gives you some extra money to plow back into your garden to grow more food so that's my presentation so Hillary do we have some questions I think we probably do We do have some questions, yes, awesome. that have come in. 
Oops. Um, we've got we've got about 15 minutes, so I'll I'll pose as many as we can get to. Hopefully, we'll okay. get through all of them. But if we don't, then um, you had your your email there. Um, yeah. So the first question came through. Um, what are your thoughts on grafted trees? Okay. Um, yes, they're the best because um, typically, I mean, you talk about a lot of a lot of trees are, are grafted because the uh, they're very fragile and a lot of times they don't make it so to take take a uh the the uh the roots of a tree that's that's stronger and uh is is the best way to do it matter of fact most times when you buy uh buy a tree from even the big places like uh stark brothers and uh Gurney, they're mostly grafted. So uh, yes, I would I would think that would be a good uh, a good thing to do is is get a grafted tree. So all right. So the next question came in. Um, do we need to do anything to protect strawberry plants over the winter? Uh, with the parentheses, this was our first year growing them. No, you really don't. What I do though is perennial beds, you know, when, when you're growing your uh, cucumber bed or whatever, that dies off and, and, you know, you get a good opportunity to put down your mulch and, and uh, clean everything out. But your perennial beds, um, you know, you don't really have to, you don't really have to cover them up. But what I typically do is I put down, so I'm an organic garden, so I put down some, some compost to feed them. And then I put over some straw mulch or some crushed leaves for mulch because that may protect them a little bit from the elements. Probably doesn't do a whole heck of a lot, but I know one thing, it certainly turns to compost, uh, you know, for the next season. So you really don't have to, they're, they're pretty hardy, but to give them a little bit of extra, like I say, I put the compost and then, and then put a, a mulch over them, so. And good luck. They're a great crop. You'll love them. Kids love them. Grownups love them. And uh, they're easy. So what else we got, Hillary? Uh, the next question on the list is, can you can with oil, for example, uh, like olives are canned? I'm sorry, say that again? So when oh, you're no. doing... Uh, uh, can you can with olives? I think I like with, with oil. Is that it? The yes. Can, can you use oil for canning? Um, I know people have infusions and I don't know. I don't know that process. I know one thing. I don't think it would last as long. Uh, so I, I would check that, that website, but I, I'm not sure if that would be considered a canning process. If you can store anything uh, that long in your own home. So I, I don't know. Sorry. Uh, send me an email. I can certainly research it, but I, I'm not. I, I'm not sure. So, okay. So the next question that came in was: um, Do eggplants like to climb to climb a trellis or grow along the ground in the garden? Eggplants are a short, short plant. They're kind of like I would guess you would say a very slender bush. Um, they don't typically grow along the ground. They typically grow upright like a, uh, a pepper plant. And um, I, I don't find them very easy to trellis. Uh, so I, I just grow them. If they do, if the plants get too tall, they only grow, I don't know, two and a half feet tall. Uh, so I, I suppose you could trellis them if you want to, but I think they do find just you know, standing, and if they get kind of floppy, what I do is I, I'll stake, I'll put a stake up and, and tie them to the stake. I use a little bit of the uh, uh, Velcro, or or uh, if I can do it, uh, you know, if it's if it's not too heavy, not too much pressure on it, I'll use a, a what do they call it? A zip tie. But you got to be careful with that because if you do it too tight, it, it can it can damage the uh, uh, the plant. But eggplants are great. I just harvested one today, in matter of fact. But they're about fizzled out by now because they, they, they like the summer. So I still have peppers though. What else do we have, Hillary? The next question on the list is how can we grow potatoes in a garden? 
first of all, uh, there's nothing like grown potatoes in the garden. They're awesome. They taste so much better. Matter of fact, when you do air frying and you cut up, uh, I don't know, I have an air fryer. You, if you cut up a potato to, to air fry it, you have to let it soak for a half an hour to get out all those heavy starches. The potatoes you buy in the store, like I say, they're not selling them to you because they taste good. They're, they're very hard and they, and they will go, you know, you can travel all the way from Idaho or, or wherever uh, to New England without damaging them. But the, the new potatoes are so sweet and they're wonderful. What you do is you, uh, you, can, you, you need a bed that's 12 inches deep and you, and you put, and you dig uh, deep trenches all the way to the bottom. And then you put in your seed potato. It's best to grow potatoes from eyes of the potato. You take the potato and you, uh, and you cut it into pieces that at least have two different, two or three eyes on each piece of potato and put them all the way in the bottom and then cover them up with the soil. Potatoes, the potato plant will start growing up. Uh, to, you know, it, it'll reach, even if it's two, two and a half feet deep, the potato plant will, will make it all the way up and it will deposit uh, potatoes on the way. So potatoes actually grow up. They don't grow down like a carrot. So you need to plant them at the bottom. You need to use rich soil. You need to rotate your crop if you can possibly do it. Uh, and once the potato starts coming up, uh, the plant starts growing out of the ground, you need to, uh, to throw more dirt on it because potatoes have to be grown. The potatoes have to stay underground or they, will, they won't taste good. They, they get some kind of, Actually, it's a point, it's a toxin, a very mild toxin, and it wouldn't make you sick unless you ate a whole bunch of, but it doesn't taste good. So 12 inches down, plant them in a trench. And once they start coming, the plants start coming to the top, throw them all, throw more soil over them. And the reason you try to, uh, when you want to maybe rotate it is because actually the nightshades in the same family as uh, tomatoes, uh, peppers, and eggplant. And they get up, but they get a lot of bugs. Some bugs, like for example, Colorado potato beetle, will will host on the potatoes, and they'll actually go and eat your uh, your other tender uh, nightshades, like your your tomatoes and peppers. So they get buggy. That's why you want to rotate them if you can. There's also grow bags for them. They can be up to 20, uh, 20 gallon grow bags. You can use those as well if you want to try it out. But by all means, try the purple ones, try the fingerlings, try the ones that are pink inside and, uh, and have fun with it. What else we got, Hillary? Uh, we've got a question here. Uh, do you know of any other cool ways to repurpose trash for gardening? The milk jugs were a great example. Oh, oh my goodness, of course. Um, so uh, trash, when, when it comes to anything trash, newspaper, uh, paper bags, all that kind of stuff. You can certainly, as I say, shred that up and use it in your compost. Any type of, uh, a, a lot of times cans that you use, like a tin can that you use. A lot of times people uh, surround uh, pl plant, uh, uh, they uh, put those over the top of, they, oh, excuse me, let me, hold on a second. They cut out the top and the bottom of the can and they put it on top of their little, the little plant so that uh, it will surround it so no uh, bugs get to the stem. Uh, you can use any kind of lot of bins that you have or, or something that's large and there's always, you always want to store, store different, different materials. Uh, you know, in it, different fertilizers, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you know, I have some broken down. I had a, a uh, any extra piece of trash you have, like fencing or old your old windows you can use to make a, a, a you know, make your own greenhouse. I mean, there's just so many ways you can use your, 
your uh, your trash and in, in, in the garden. Everything I have, a lot of stuff I have is is re, is repurposed. You can use old pallets to grow vertically, uh, or you can use old pallets to make compost bins. Uh, there's just so much. So uh, that's a great question because I'm always up for you know being being more uh, sustainable and, and taking care of the earth. Anything else, Hillary? Yes, we have two more questions. So okay. one came in about growing garlic, which you covered in your presentation, but there's a corollary question here, um, which I think the answer is yes to, but is garlic considered a hearty vegetable? A hearty vegetable? Hearty? Is that what you said? Yes. Yes, yes. it's certainly hearty. You like I, as I say, you grow, you plant it in in October, and it goes and it goes right through the 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 frost, the freezing winter. So it certainly is hardy. Matter of fact, if you had garlic um, and you didn't harvest it, uh, the next year it would sprout again. You wouldn't get nice neat uh, heads, you know. But but it's actually it's we don't we don't grow it as a perennial, but it is hardy and it is actually a perennial perennial crop so yes it's very hard it loves the cold so people in other parts of the country uh grow garlic they don't they don't grow it they don't have a freeze their garlic doesn't taste as good as our garlic so we have this uh hard neck garlic as i say we like to grow that it grows really well in our area but it has a three to four uh month uh uh that it's still good when it's out of the ground. So we have to, after three or four months, you know, for it to last the rest of the year, we have to do some kind of preservation. We have to, we have to freeze it or, or dehydrate it. The soft neck garlic will, sometimes if you don't put enough mulch down, it may die on you, but the soft neck garlic will last you six to nine months without doing anything, just on the shelf. So they are very hardy crops and, and they're great to grow. So a lot of fun, easy, and uh, and you can make some money as well. And your food will taste a lot better. So, what else so our, have? yeah, our last question here. Um, we have someone who's looking for tips for growing eggplants. And this person says, um, pH levels were tested and started late spring, plenty of flowers, but no fruit. And they've gone two years in a row with no harvest. Eggplant. Okay, so um, your if your eggplants. Okay, so if your eggplants growing and your soil is very fertile, a lot of times it has the main component, the main macronutrient in your soil is nitrogen. Sometimes uh, plants don't multicast well, so if you have a pepper or the cousin eggplant, they don't taste the same. It's in the same family and they have soil with too much nitrogen, they're gonna concentrate on growing nice and big. And they're not gonna concentrate on bearing, bearing fruit. So what you need to do is maybe you can try to put a little bit of lime. I don't mean the lime, the fruit. I mean, you know, the powdered lime or a little bit of uh, hardwood ash and mix it in and use that as a, a you know, a top dressing uh, to see if you can stimulate it because that has uh, potassium in it and that may get it to, uh, that may get it to fruit. It's too late this year though, um, unfortunately. So uh, you probably may have just too much nitrogen in there. So it's, it's growing, uh, it's doing too much of a good job and, and it does, your soil may not have the, uh, the right level of potash. So. Give it a whirl. Any anything else, Hillary? Yeah, I just had one more question come in. Um, is there a secret to get the tomato seeds out of the gel-like substance to dry for next year? That's gelatinous membrane, and that's on tomatoes, and it's on cucumbers. I have a I have a class a presentation on the life cycle of seeds. And I'll share that with you. If you send me an email, I'll send you the, the PowerPoint. Yes, there is. 
what you do is you put it in a glass of water and you keep stirring it and you leave it there for a couple of days. Within a couple of days, you're going to get um, some mold on top of the water. You remove it. And, uh, and then you uh, take the seeds out. It's a messy process. And you dry them, uh, air dry them on a uh, piece of parchment paper or uh, uh, maybe a paper plate, but not a paper towel. Because if you do it on a paper towel, it, it will get all mushy. And, uh, and that's how you do it. You, it, it. It takes a couple of days, but the water in that molding process will remove that gelatinous membrane from the tomato and the, in the, uh, in the cucumber. And um, if, you, if you store them with the gelatinous, if you don't get it all off, uh, you may be introducing that mold into the, uh, you know, and, and you may kill all your seeds. So there is another process uh, for, for those crops because of that. Also, just an FYI, some people make spaghetti sauce and they actually remove the seeds in the skin from the tomatoes, but the seeds and that, that, that gel-like uh, substance in, in the skin, that's where all the flavor is. So, uh, so yeah, I would definitely uh, send me in your email and I'll send you that, the copy of that presentation about the seeds. So thank you so much, uh, Kate, for the very informative presentation. And thank you to everybody for coming out. Um, I've, if it's okay with you, Kate, I can include your email address in the follow-up email that we send oh, out. Oh, that's great. Library. Yep, thank and you so also, much. Yep, thank, thank you again. We'll see you soon, Hillary. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Good night, everybody. Bye-bye.